For those of you who have been here before for the Life Without Disease series, in the beginning it started because we changed how it is that we characterized the Institute to the lay community. But it has to still be a very smart, intelligent, high-functioning lay community because when we talk about life without disease, there's a deep story to it. We're really talking about life without the symptoms of disease, so not the challenges of life, not the exposure to those things that you have to overcome and cure yourself of, but the idea that you don't go through life living through a set of symptoms and diseases that wear you down. You let the immune system take over and do some things. Now tonight, we're actually going to talk about life without diabetes. So that's the disease of focus. But it, it, it's actually, it stands in the place that many other diseases could be as well. And so tonight, we're going to delve into the, one of the most difficult puzzles to solve. But by doing it, there are going to be these huge collaterals. And so all the people that are both living with diabetes and supporting the research around it, they're actually plowing a lot of knowledge back into humankind and into, into other problems that we're going to be able to overcome because it's an autoimmune disease. So what is life without diabetes? What does this even look like in, in rough terms? Matthias is going to come up and tell you in, in some more precise terms. But in rough terms, life without diabetes would be where you have normal insulin levels. In other words, they go up and down right when you need them. And you regulate your blood sugar. And you do all the things that people who aren't diagnosed with diabetes have. And that's definitely going to look like an early preventative treatment. Because diabetes strikes at all ages, but oftentimes early. And from then on, you have diabetes even if you manage it. There won't be lifelong insulin injections. And there won't be transplants or refills or things that you go in and essentially in the back of your mind are always managing that I have diabetes, therefore I have something I have to pay attention to. Otherwise, it could become lethal. And also, no easy way outs. Not simply a broad immunosuppressant that is a, a trade-off where you'd be worse off than simply managing your diabetes. This is incredibly, incredibly difficult, what I just explained. We've never done this for anything in the history of people. But it's, of course, worth it. That's because right now, I mean, let's face it, the landscape looks like this. You're born, you go in, and you're fine. Some time elapses. You don't feel so well. And you get a very specific kind of sick. And pretty soon, you run into, after a little bit more time, you run into the right doctor. And they tell you you have a pancreas problem. This is a place where your insulin's made. Hmm, well, what do you do with that? If you don't treat it, you're dead. So you're going to do something about it. And so you get introduced to what I call the world of syringes, where you're always thinking about your blood. You go from someone who thinks about what they do to very deeply, what is my blood sugar? Imagine that. You're sitting there thinking about, what is my hormone level and the blood sugar moment to moment all the time? It's incredibly oppressive. And even if you do that perfectly, it's not a cure. You're just treating something from here on out. So it's a real challenge. So the life without diabetes is going to look different. You're going to be born, and you're going to go in, and you're going to be tested. And you're not just going to be tested for diabetes, because in this future that I'm describing, you're going to be tested in a way where we're going to understand your immune system. And we're going to understand all the things it's capable of, all the things that it might do well, might do wrong. And you're going to come up with some data, some biomarker. It's going to be a blip. And someone's going to say, well, Looks like you're headed down the road to diabetes. So you're going to be sad because all of a sudden you have to think about it. But we're going to say, but there's something we can do right now. And it's probably going to involve a big needle or something, which is even worse. But one time, you're going to do it this one time. And then you're going to spend a lot of time with no symptoms of diabetes. You will have done something way back here without going through that step. And you can find something else to think about. And that's it. So it's a simple execution of a very, very difficult puzzle. So why is it that you aren't at a place that's called the La Jolla Institute for Diabetes Research? We're talking about diabetes. I mean, are we endocrine specialists? That's what your insulin does. It's a hormone. Um, do we study the pancreas? No. But diabetes is an autoimmune disease. You can't 
get the kind of diabetes we all think about when we think about type 1 and most forms of type 2, unless your immune system is behind it. And so it's an immunologist that has to get in there and dig around. And why, why continue the basic research? In other words, why here and why not at a place that's making, say, a really good, just superhero style insulin delivery system? And the reason why is that even if we could just through clini clinical trials go through and fine tune how we manage things, it's not a cure. And even more so, we're learning more and more about diabetes to the point where we're getting to the point of redefining it. These type 1, type 2, Matthias will talk about it more. It's a very curious concept why we talk about it that way. So we aren't simply looking at fine tuning the medicine that's already in the field out there with your endocrinologist. It's not a small tweak that we're after. We're looking at really understanding the nuts and bolts right down to the most basic fundamental parts of the immune system and how you work before we can make that big step to the life without diabetes. So with that, a picture. And I put that up there. So I have a seven-year-old. And this is me when I was about six, going on seven. And this is uh, my dad over here, Uncle Herbie, Uncle Don, Uncle Roger. Grandpa Wilson. And I look at it, and I can't help but think of heart disease, heart disease, heart disease, cancer. Uncle Don died of a heart attack, so he should be heart disease, but it's not. See, Uncle Don died when he was about 50. Everybody else except for uh, Grandpa Wilson here, they're still alive. But they'll probably get heart disease. They grew up on the south side of Chicago with me. That's what we do. <laughs> but I heard about his heart attack, and I said, you know, I miss this guy, but he died of a heart attack. And someone said, no, he didn't die of a heart attack. He died because people with diabetes are more susceptible to heart disease and heart attacks. And so the thing that we're after here is pretty simple. I just want to go heart disease, heart disease, heart disease, heart disease, <laughs> cancer, and I'm happy. Take diabetes out of it. Let us worry about something else for a little while. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Matthias von Herrick. Uh, back in 88, he got his MD in Germany, in Freiburg. I met Matthias actually when he had come over, and first he was a postdoc, and then he was, um, what, do they even call it junior faculty over there? He's working with a, a, a very well known immunologist at the Scripps Research Institute. And someone told me, uh, you know, Steve, if you're going to be doing this stuff in diabetes and you're now in San Diego, you really need to find this hotshot, Matthias von Herreth. And so I did. And uh, we wanted to do uh, a small project together. And as it turns out, I was setting up, and I was, I was kind of a whiz kid too, so I was setting up this spectrotyping. And it was going to be great, and we were going to get some cells. And, you know, and it took me a little while, and I called him, and he said, well, yeah, I already had Rafi. I'm going to do it. So what I like about Matthias is that he's not going to sit around and wait. He's going to just do it. So if you want to do it, you better act quick, or Rafi Ahmed's going to get your samples, and that's the end of that. So, but we're good friends now. <laughs> so without, uh, without further delay, Matthias von Herth. Yep, it's uh, left, right, and that's the green pointer if you want it. Well, um, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, I will take you for a little journey about diabetes, and at the end you can ask questions, but if you don't understand something, you can also ask questions in the middle. This shouldn't be a big problem. I will talk all the way from basic aspects of diabetes, what it is, um, about new insights about the pathology of diabetes in humans, many surprises there. So I think hopefully that will be interesting for many of you. And then at the end of the day, about new treatments, and interventions and strategic aspects. A big overarching theme will be, and I really want you to understand it, and it's not, um, I think, something that everybody realizes, is how complicated the overall situation is in type 1 diabetes. Not only to understand the pathology, but also to develop treatments. Um, at this point, with the basic research in the Hoy Institute and also being um, working for Novo Nordisk, um, I sort of span the whole spectrum of the overall situation, which has been quite interesting. And as a disclaimer, I will not discuss any Novo Nordisk drugs or approaches. 
Um, so that's an important aspect about this. So coming to the, to the basic pathology of diabetes and the way it's understood usually, um, usually it's classified in type 1 and type 2. The difference between those, and this is historically, and that's still done by many like this, and certainly when you come uh, for a medical diagnosis, type 1 is the diabetes where the immune system attacks the beta cells and wipes them out. And type 2 is the diabetes if you have too much weight and you become insulin resistant and so forth and less immune system involvement. So these lines, and we're going to get back to that, they are blurry. This is probably not the best way to classify the disease. It's probably going to change also in the interest of having better targeted therapies down the road. And it will probably end up that we're going to classify immune diabetes from non-immune diabetes and then we're going to classify metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance as a separate entities, realizing that all of this can converge together and overlap in the same patients. I think that will probably make a lot more sense down the road, also for devising the treatments in a more targeted fashion. One thing I should mention right in the beginning, there is certainly many type 2 diabetics that are classified as type 2 as adults, who probably have one or the other form of type 1 diabetes and very similar pathology of what I will show you in a few minutes. A couple of other words about how our um, sugar in the blood is regulated. It's regulated by insulin as one hormone, glucagon on the other side as a hormone. And these are in the human body regulatory circuits that sort of balance each other out. That sounds rather simplistic. Uh, many things in the human body are based on these feedback loops stabilized better. The problem arises if you start interrupting these type of feedback loops, in this case when you start losing insulin production in the pancreas, the system becomes unstable and it doesn't always become unstable in a simplistic manner. So just putting insulin back in, and those of you who have type 1 diabetes know this well, is not such an easy endeavor that we can just very easily achieve because of these feedback systems. And that's something to keep in mind. And there's something also that we only gradually learn to appreciate and understand. And even more recently, um, there's quite some interest also in our team here to understand in what cases even the alpha cells that make glucagon are wiped out in diabetes and what that does to the pathology of the disease. Now, the way this looks anatomically, just to give you some insight into this, when you have the pancreas, the pancreas is attached to, to the gut system, and it's sort of a flowery organ, like many of the glands. It makes in the, what is called the exocrine pancreas, it makes digestive enzymes, and then located all through the pancreas are little islets. They're called islets of Langerhans, and they have beta cells in there, alpha cells, some other cells also, and they make insulin and glucagon, and they're responsible and distributed throughout the pancreas to achieve glucose homeostasis and also storage of glucose in, in cells of the body. And these little islets, they look like this. These are the glandular things that secrete the enzymes for the digestion and then these little islets are embedded in the pancreas. You can appreciate here, this is a picture from a mouse with the two photon technique we developed here at La Jolla Institute. Um, and they are artificially looking live into the mouse pancreas. The islets are colored. So the islets are these big green blobs and what you should appreciate it here, hopefully when the movie runs, is that the cells that attack the islets, in this case, are these little green guys. And they come maybe to a certain extent from vessels and enter the pancreas. This all is area of the exocrine or pancreas that makes digestive enzymes. And then you here have the islets where the beta cells are. So you can see these cells are moving around. This is a 30 minute time lapse. They move quite a bit. And you have to appreciate when the attacks occur, if they occur in a similar way in the human pancreas, you can derive from this movie that maybe the cells, once they enter some lobe of the pancreas, they can roam around quite freely. And then they reach the way we quantitated this essentially by random. So this is all random walk where these guys are looking around just like ants on the kitchen floor. They essentially are reached by random the islets. And when they find in the islets something they like to recognize, which immune cells usually do, they search around for things they can recognize, they start killing the islets in this model. Now what that means for human diabetes, maybe, 
is that we can explain with this the appearance of human diabetes that is very what you call lobular, meaning that it goes from lobe to lobe in the pancreas. It's something that we haven't understood for a long time. And it's maybe even responsible that the disease can come and go. And maybe you attack one lobe and it stops, then you attack another lobe of the pancreas, then it stops, another lobe, and so forth. You would call this a relapsing, remitting disease course. And maybe what all is needed to attack one lobe is the entry of these bad guys in this lobe. Then they roam around. And over time, because they can move a lot, they're going to find all the islets, and the islets disappear. It's at least one explanation of how human diabetes might evolve. Now coming to some rather uh, sour questions for many of you, and one being, why has this taken so long for this disease? And I give you some reasons and the overview, and then we're going to get into the details. So there's still, and we'll talk about this a lot today, a, a rather basic non-understanding of the human disease, even after all this year, mostly by limited <coughs> organ access to the human pancreas. And I tell you how we can get around them. Um, we have issues that even new beta cells, when they're put in, are still attacked. Companies like Viasite who put new stem cells into capsules trying to get around this. Um, we have complicated trials with diverse people that take a long time to see how beta cell function is preserved. And it costs a lot of money. So we have to engage at some point pharma companies because an average trial in recent type 1 diabetes, recent onset type 1 diabetes, according to our calculations, fully powered, good biomarkers, between 30 and 45 million dollars. It's not cheap, these things. They're pretty expensive. And we still have this misunderstanding what's type 1 and type 2, and that somehow interferes with our ability to recruit the right patients for the right trial, and we have to have better markers and a better understanding about this. Now coming to the basic pathology and how can we better understand the basic pathology of the disease. We have been getting involved here at La Jolla Institute about five, six years ago with the National Pancreatic Organ Donor Consortium. There was an idea that was founded by George Eisenbart when he was still alive and is now directed by Mark Atkinson. The way this works is, is the realization that we have too few human pancreatic studied. And you can easily imagine you can not do this in a live patient. So through the organ pancreatic organ donor consortium, the way this goes about is that the pancreatic that are slated for organ transplant, among other organs, are collected in pristine fashion at these transplant OPOs, and then centralized, if they don't qualify for transplant, in Gainesville. And then something very interesting has happened. It's a very scarce resource. There's not that many human pancreatic, now about 200 that are in this consortium. Everybody has shared things. This is actually something good in science. So there's now over 70, 80 teams who work on these pancreatic with various degrees of expertise on beta cells, on function of the alpha cells, on beta cell and immune destruction and so forth. And we're all learning together in real time. Even it has happened that pharma industry has realized that they cannot own this resource, but that everybody will better off if they, for example, donate unique reagents to this resource so that everybody can see in real time, let's say, where the GLP-1 receptor is expressed and things like that. So this is, has been tremendously helpful for understanding the disease. And it has shifted some paradigms in quite, um, let's say, in a drastic fashion, in ways we haven't thought it would shift things. So I have these um, now and then slides to illustrate what has changed in understanding of the disease. And for some of you who have been maybe pro preoccupied with type 1 diabetes for a long time, some of this will be new. So back then, we all learned, I wrote in my reviews in the 90s, it's an autoimmune disease. We are not sure about this anymore. We are not so sure. Why are we not sure? Because when we look at human pancreatic in the pre-diabetic phase, often we don't see that much inflammation in the islets. The other thing we see, and I show you this, we see lots of cells that are not tackling the beta cells or specific for beta cells. So we have to at least be open to the fact that yes, it could be an autoimmune disease, meaning that cells react with your own body, or it could not, in my mind, 50-50. Other things could play a role. There could be a virus play the role. 
And recently, Teresa here in um, La Jolla has discovered that there is also some inflammation in the exocrine pancreas, the area that makes the digestive juices. And it's actually smaller in type 1 diabetes. So maybe there's other factors contributing to this. And the question, what causes the disease, whether this is primary a reaction to your own beta cells or whether there are other triggers, becomes more complicated. What we know, and just to be clear, around the time of diagnosis, type 1 diabetes has a significant component of self-reactivity, and from what we can gather, that is a clinical problem. So we are not arguing that self-reactivity or auto-reactivity plays no role. We are arguing here whether this is the primary cause of the disease or whether we should look, for example, for enteroviruses and other factors that ex affect the pancreas or the exocrine pancreas. Now coming um, to the exocrine pancreas, it's interesting what we have seen here, I mentioned this just a minute ago, we thought that only the beta cells are being targeted. But many times when you look at human pancreas inflammation, you see something like this. You have these green islets that still make insulin. And if you can appreciate it, there's red dots. And this is your immune reactivity. Not so much. The inflammation of the islets in the human pancreas is not so much. You have a fair amount of exocrine inflammation also. So that still doesn't negate the hypothesis that the islets at the end are destroyed through inflammation. It just says we have to vigi be vigilant that there might be other things that are contributing to the disease process. And maybe some of the other things also need to be treated. Last but not least, what comes along these lines is that the Finnish group has published maybe four or five years ago that in human type 1 immune diabetes, there is changes of the metabolism that actually precede changes of the immune system. So other factors might already go wrong and contribute to the disease. At least we should keep an open mind about that. And therapeutically, that could be quite interesting. We thought that is a primary problem of programming immune cells to attack self structures. And that still might be true. That has been a lot of research. We know from animal models for sure that in principle, this can happen. We can be very sure about that. We just don't know whether in all cases of human diabetes, it's like this. We are also sure from certain syndromes in humans that if you don't select these cells right, that can attack your own body structures, that that can cause fundamental problems of self-reactivity and autoimmunity. We know all that also for a fact. We just don't know whether the average of the road case of type 1 diabetes that you see in humans always has this type of problem and whether it's the primary cause. What we can say is that with a specific staining that we developed here, you can find cells that react with your own body structures after diagnosis. So these cells are there. And we also know from animal models that a few of them can do a lot of damage. So the jury is still up. It could be that these self-reactive cells cause the disease and drive the disease. Or it could be that they are bystanders. And I just want to uh, put this out to you so you can understand and appreciate some of the complicated issues we have with understanding the cause of the disease and the way this disease is progressing. It could, for example, be, and Teresa had looked at this, that cells that recognize viral structures are actually more frequent in the pancreas. So why not those cells also have to contribute to the process? We don't know. But maybe they're only bystanders and they don't contribute to the process. Now coming back to the disease process, and we have been redrawing the line how beta cells are being lost probably over my career at least five or six times. So there has been a lot of, lot of wavering to understand how this goes. It went all the way to a line that went precipitously down, to a line that was linearly down, then to a line we had wavy. I think the best we understand it now is that over many years in humans, can also be compressed and shorter, there's attacks on the beta cells that might reflect these attacks on lobes. But it's actually very curious that somebody who has autoantibodies, which some of you might know, signify a risk to develop the disease, two autoantibodies, three autoantibodies, the surface area of beta cells in the pancreas is higher. So that indicates that at that point, there is an immune attack. There's autoantibodies there. But the beta cells, they haven't all been lost. They might be regenerating or fighting back. And then 
at the time around diagnosis, we are pretty sure there's also more inflammation, what we usually see, then the beta cells must get lost in function and in mass relatively rapidly. That's what we, how we can paint the picture of the disease. Therapeutically, it's quite a challenge. If this slope becomes faster here, that's where we really should intervene, and we should really grasp the patients just before they get the disease. That's a fundamental challenge. Maybe a bit easier in children, but it's harder to do immune therapies in children. It's harder in adults when many of them are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. It's a complicated situation. And over here, I think we have to face that there will be situations where this disease is remitted and we have no immune reactivity. So if we come in with an immunosuppressive drug, we're actually not treating anything. So that is something we have to keep in mind, which means the drug that we give here early in prevention, ultimately division of a vaccine, should have very little side effects, actually as little side effects as a human vaccine should have. So that's what we're facing, understanding now the disease and how the beta cells are lost. What is also quite interesting, which has been become apparent over the last five years is that many beta cells are still left alive after diagnosis. The notion used to be that all beta cells are gone. And in some patients that's true. In quite many patients that is not true. There is microsecreting beta cells. And in some patients even over decades there's many beta cells left. And the battle for these beta cells seems to rage on. There's still signs of immune reactivation and all this. But the beta cells somehow, maybe because they gener regenerate better, they outlive longer in these patients. It's better to retain beta cells overall because the management of the disease becomes easier if you have some, of course, of your own insulin production left. We also thought that these self-reactive cells would be the main culprit. We have now come to realize, and this is an observation that already 20 years ago Alan Faulis made, but the NPOT consortium has really corroborated this, that these whole islets, <coughs> here showing a human islet, this is one year after diagnosis, they are light up because they put up immune recognition molecules. They're in a sense sick. So there's many other things wrong with the islets than just the beta cells being selectively killed. The whole islet in this case upregulates an MHC class 1 molecule that makes the beta cells and other cells easier to recognize. And the, the islets become dysfunctional from that is our hypothesis. So there's other things, the bottom line is to understand about type 1 diabetes. The more we look actually, it's a bit frustrating, the more things we encounter that we don't know. This was a bit unexpected for me. So we have to consider now that autoimmunity could be the primary cause, but maybe it's secondary. We know the exocrine pancreas is smaller and is affected in type 1 diabetes. Um, we know that many immune cells are bystanders and don't recognize beta cells, but they still might contribute to the process, but we don't know to which degree. And we probably can assume that the immune attack is relapsing, remitting. Some beta cells in some patients can persist a long, long time. Um, and then beta cells can orchestrate their own demise. Mark Atkinson had, had written a nice article about this. So it's a vicious circle between beta cells becoming sick and the immune system becoming interested in this. Armed with this new knowledge at places like here in the Hoya Institute, we have to now go and refine our animal models and improve them to reflect the new things we have learned from studying the human pathology so we can define smart ways, for example, to interfere with this MHC class 1 to disrupt the immune process once we have learned these type of lessons. A last word and then I come to the therapeutic part and then we can take questions. I, I mentioned in the beginning that this classification of diabetes is really a problem and a hindrance right now. It's a hindrance for trials and for finding the right patients. Because many type 2s can have immune syndromes, but they are not well characterized. We don't know who that is. We now just begin to learn that type 2 diabetes with immune components maybe loses their beta cells faster and it's not good. So it's something that we have to diagnose and appreciate. And there are some type 1s hidden among the type 2 diagnosed patients in the US, some that probably would profit from an immune therapy. I would suggest that down the road, we should probably better diagnose what is enhanced, an immune-mediated diabetes component. And all of these could occur at the same time, or some of them. A metabolic syndrome that will involve the liver, 
that's not always related to obesity, complicated situation, and then insulin resistance. And all these things, are, of course, often come together. But they can also be separate syndromes then, uh, that can occur. And they might require separate or fine-tuned treatments when the disease is diagnosed. So we will see how this goes. Um, of course, right now the notion is that as long as we can treat with insulin, we don't need all these differentiations. But if we want to make smarter ways to treat the disease, we will need to record these differences to get at the meat of the matter. Now, coming to trials, and this has been something that have, we have been quite involved with over the last uh, maybe three, four years, you can ask, why has it been so difficult? Whether it's self-reactive or not self-reactive, you find immune cells in there, and so the immune system is involved. And we know that. There has been people like Walter Rally in Brazil who has treated the disease after diagnosis with a non-myeloid ablative bone marrow transplant. The drastic intervention, it was a protocol derived from oncological treatments in children. It's probably, by and large, not safe enough to do this to many patients. But we have learned from that that if you do that, 60% at diagnosis can become insulin independent, and 30% about make it for five years. That still doesn't justify the treatment. But it shows you that tackling the immune system is an important component. So you can ask, well, if this is the issue, just do it more specific than this bone marrow transplant, and how can we hit the speed for it? And we have tried this for many, many years, initially with cyclosporin, that also can result in some insulin um, independent. But you have these side effects. For example, with cyclosporin, it's nephrotoxicity. And for some reason, maybe because this disease already remaps and relapses in these lobes, the disease tends to come back. It's not treated if you immune suppress once. So the notion then is that you have to leave these immunosuppressants in the system. Actually not so different from arthritis and lupus and other diseases. They can have very similar features of relapsing, remitting. So that makes a major issue about the side effects. And we have not been able at this point with the trials that have been run to hit this proper sweet spot. And I personally think we will not hit it with monotherapies. This is not going to work. So you're going to run into issues. The way combination therapies were done in oncology, they work pretty well. You have a cancer, stage four. You have ethical, a lot of, ethically a lot of leeway. You have a short trial time, and you can achieve an effect with one drug. In this disease, you don't have ethically the same leeway. You can give strong immunosuppressive drugs to little children for sure. And it might be that once you dose the drug right, you're not going to achieve an endpoint that you like at all because it's too little. So you cannot put the single drug treatment on the market after you do a trial. This is a big conundrum. So you have to start with combo trials. The FDA is not going to be very happy to see combination trials with two drugs that are not approved. This is usually not the way it goes. So it's a fundamental difficulty, but we have to realize that we have to start with combination trials, ideally not with two unapproved drugs, so we can surmount some hurdles more easily. So we will be doing this with several combinations, because this has since probably a decade been my wish, because of aforementioned problems. And we hope that we can, with a combination, just like in oncology, strike the right efficacy side effect profile. In the end of the game, we also want to develop vaccines that redirect the immune system to make peacekeeper cells, and then protect the beta cells in a fashion like a vaccine without having off-target effects. That would be the ideal situation. But these vaccines have to be tested, and it's a long development process. Yes, other new approaches that are very interesting. No one others has no stake in Viacite, but I, I like this approach, so I put it out here. So Viacite has made here locally in town capsules around beta cells made from stem cells. They need a capsule so that the beta cells are not being attacked by the uh, foreign immune response and by the recurring autoimmune response. I find this approach very interesting. Because at the end of the day, you could substitute, ev even if it's not all part of the beta cell mass in the individuals, and they're going to start transplants uh, pretty soon here at UCSD. Still, we don't know how interested the immune system will get, even if the beta cells are in capsules. So this is something we have to wait for and see. So how does the translational process work, and what are the timelines? And so I just want to discuss this a little bit here 
the way some of the things that we had discovered at La Jolla Institute have moved forward. So we did some vaccines many years ago. We also did combination therapies and animal models. And we did eyelid-specific therapies. These are things that I strongly believe that, that they're going to be needed, not as single st standing therapies, but as a combination. You discover this, and then, as you can see here in the time scale, a long process ensues. Some of you might be rather familiar with this, but it takes a lot of time. This is not an easy matter, and it's for the right reasons. These things need to be safe, they need to be tested properly, and they need to follow the process. So we are not putting drugs into people that are working from some type of a hearsay. And what you have to do, you have to test the uh, safety, then you have to run a phase one, phase two trial. Usually in type one, we think if the drugs are safe, or there's already known safety for combinations, we can have a phase two trial. Phase two trial, we mentioned $35 million, so it's a significant amount of money involved. And then after the outcome of phase two, you have to decide where you place your phase three trial and how you orchestrate this trial to then move yourself towards a licensure of a therapy. So all this, you have here three to four years, you have six to eight years. This is about a little bit more than a decade this takes, just so you can appreciate the process that it takes from a basic discovery to reach the clinic. And there is really no other ways around it. Unfortunately, in type 1 diabetes, even more so, the trials taking still too long. Maybe we can build ways around this by efficient imaging of inflammation in beta cells, but the beta cells but it would have to be non-invasive. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck with a trial duration of about one to two years altogether and doing that ideally right from the get-go with combinations. And we do some of this at Novo Notice, of course, and there's other pharma companies who are doing that. But that gives you a feeling of the overall process. What is sort of the bottom line? of the therapeutic outlook uh, for type 1 diabetes. We definitely will need some sort of an immune therapy because the immune system gets interested in beta cells and even if the beta cells regrow, that only rekindles the interest of the immune system in beta cells. So either we need a vaccine or induction therapy or an immune therapy in some form. Um, I like combination therapies, this what we talked about. I'm personally not a big believer, after so many trials and tribulations, in the fact that we missed a magic bullet. Of course, this is always possible. But we have tested, probably at this point, over 300 things that more or less can work in animal models. And some of them, with the most promising profile, have to be combined for combination therapy in humans. That's just how that's going to go. I don't think we have missed much, in other words. That shouldn't keep us from looking, but if we just take toll of what we have right now, I think it's not that likely that all of a sudden we find that molecule that only grows beta cells in your body and nothing else will grow. Maybe not impossible, but we would have to be really, really lucky for that type of thing. I think the way these therapies will go, we have an induction therapy, has a bit more side effects, and then use a maintenance therapy with drugs that are either eyelid specific or have very, very little side effects and are tolerable and are preferable to lifelong insulin. That's really the bar it has to measure up to. Um, I believe that we should prioritize these things in animal models. There has always been this controversy, maybe animal models don't reflect the human disease. Of course, they don't reflect all of the human disease. They're animal models. But still, we need the animal models to understand what's going on and to ask proper questions. This will not go away. We need animal models to understand mechanisms. We need animal models to prioritize things. If we don't use them, we just lose a leg to stand on. Of course, we have other legs to stand on, like the pathology, but all this has to come together. We need all these legs to stand on. It's a difficult disease, so we need all the help we can get. We also need animal models for other things. I'm a strong believer, and Steve mentioned it in the beginning, at some point we have to do individualized medicine, so we will need these type of things. Uh, in terms of biomarkers and their development. Um, I think overall, any therapy has to measure up from being more tolerable and preferable to the patient to lifelong insulin substitution. And the bar is becoming high. We're going to have sensors. We're going to have pumps. Needles have certainly begun, become a lot better for insulin injections. So the bar is high. You cannot say that you want to tolerate a lifelong immunosuppression with all the side effects just to preserve some beta cells. That's not how this is going to go. It's going to have more effect 
uh, than just that. And that's what we're working on. So what are we doing here? Um, we really like to look for viral footprints um, with the team here at La Jolla Institute. And we look for inflammatory mediators in these pancreatic organ samples to better understand the disease. And some members of the team are here, so you should feel, to feel free um, to contact them in the reception, of course. And I'm very indebted to them. We're having a lot of fun understanding the unknown in these pancreatic samples and learning all kinds of surprising things that we never thought uh, that could exist. Um, overall, it's going to take time. I think we see now encapsulated islets. A combination therapy will start next year. Um, then there are other things that are further away. Primary vaccine, understanding the gut. That's going to take us a long time. But maybe in the next couple of decades, we can really make great strides for this disease. And I think uh, this is a time for getting the immune system tackled in the disease. We have learned a lot about the immune system in other diseases, and I think we are at a good place here. And I thank certainly the whole team here at La Hoya, and we can take questions. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to thank Matthias for uh, sharing the latest information on type 1 diabetes with us. I don't know if you realize it, but uh, Matthias is unique for a number of reasons. He uh, works here, but he also works for Novo Nordisk. He works for a pharmaceutical company, as he mentioned. And these two worlds are often very separate. And yet bringing these two worlds together, I think, is very important uh, for translating discoveries. And that's why uh, we, uh, we made this unique arrangement. Um, so I think it's a very good one. The other reason he's very, uh, very unique about Matthias is that he was named the number one diabetes researcher in the world by Expertscape uh, 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 internet site. And I thought he was like number two. So, uh, uh, no, I knew he, in other words, I knew. I knew he was good, really good, but I didn't know he was that good. No, no, I'm just kidding, of course. So, um, I'd also like to thank you for coming. Uh, we really appreciate your taking the time to come here and um, learn about uh, the role that the immune system plays in type 1 diabetes, and in fact, in many diseases, many chronic diseases uh, that, we, that we know about today that, that afflict us really have an immune system component. As Matthias says, it's sometimes not easy to understand whether it's primary or secondary, but have a strong immune system component. So one of the things that distinguishes us here is that the La Jolla Institute focuses on uh, the immune system and diseases of, the, of uh, the immune system and on immunology in general. And there really aren't many places in the world uh, that do that. And um, I think our focus on the immune system is very important. And one of the things I have to tell you is that um, we have people here working on different diseases and on infections and in vaccines, and we really don't know where the insight in type 1 diabetes is going to come from. And, and there, there, there can be di di diseases that look very different, like colitis, uh, inflammation of the intestine, and inflammation of the joint. Those two look very different or feel very different if you have the disease, but in both cases, they can be treated by an immune modulator that blocks an immune molecule called TNF. And the, the drugs that do that have names like Umira. You might see Phil Mickelson on TV with ads uh, for Umira or uh, Remicade or so on. My point is that somebody working on arthritis could make a breakthrough in type 1 diabetes. That's possible. And that's one of the, th the things that's very important um, about this place. We have a, a group of immunologists here working on very diverse uh, conditions. Uh, before I open up the floor for questions, I have two more points. And one is uh, I want to give a special thanks to those of you who are uh, President's Council or member. You have, uh, you have flags uh, on your name tag here. Uh, you are supporters of the Institute's research, and that's very, very important for us. The majority of our funds, we run on about $50 million here a year to do our research. The great majority comes from the United States federal government, which is a very important uh, funder of research, the, the National Institutes of Health. But they don't pay for everything, and they don't pay for a lot of the really innovative, risk-taking things that we want to do. They tend to be very um, safe in their funding, which there, there are reasons for that, and I, I understand them. So we really also depend on our supporters, and um, we're grateful for donations in any amount. We are a charity. We're kind of a nice-looking charity with a nice building and a lot of smart people. But at the end of the day, we're a charity. There are uh, envelopes on the table outside for you to make a donation. And as I said, a donation of any amount 
is appreciated. Finally, after this session, we invite you to enjoy refreshments and conversations out in the atrium. You are our guests in our house, and we, we're really happy you're here. And if you see people who have name tags that have labels on them, there are scientists here, uh, or there are board members here, like this one here says board, board member. I'm actually also work here. Uh, I encourage you to come up and talk to them and learn more about what we do here.